is with us. Before starting the session, I would like to request Dr. Bharati Bhorali, Assistant Professor, Department of Mass Communication, Gohati University, Assam, India. She is also a noted writer. I request Bharati Bhorali to give the welcome speech and also read out a short a bio of a resource person than Uma. Over to Bharati Bhorali. Thank you, Parthada. A very good evening to all of you from Sunlit uh, Studio uh, Film Club. And a very good evening and a warm welcome to our distinguished guest today, uh, Dan Wallman. Uh, I think uh, he does not need actually an introduction because his name is synonymous to the uh, Israeli cinema these days, uh, to those who have seen the uh, Israeli films. So uh, here is a brief note. Dan Woolman is an internationally acclaimed filmmaker from Israel. This master craftsman was born on October 28, 1941 in Jerusalem, Israel at the Film Institute of City College, New York from 1962 to 1965. And then from 1965 to 1968, he completed his studies at New York University. In 1968, then returned to his native country, Israel, and made his first feature, The Dreamer, in 1970. And I want to add here that uh, there are several YouTube, uh, YouTube videos available uh, where you can see how his films are being acclaimed uh, in different platforms and also you can also see how YouTube in different YouTube channels it is available how he had given uh, wonderful lectures. So we are very happy that sir you have given us time. Now this, uh, of his first feature Dreamer in 1970, which was an official entry at Car Film Festival over the years, Dan Wallman wrote and directed feature films, commercial films, short films, and documentaries. Some of his landmark films are Flo in 1970, which was in competitive section in Venice Film Festival. His hide and seek uh, uh, was at Berlin Film Festival. It won in Israel the Silver Rose Award for Best Film, Best Director, and Best Script. An Israeli Love Story, 2017, The Director's Angst, 2014, Gay Ani, Valley of Strength, 2010, Tied Hands, 2006, Ben's Biography, 2004, Foreign Sisters, Baby Loves are some of the films credited to him. Dance films have been traveled in numerous international film festivals, such as Ah, Venice, Berlin, Shanghai, Goa, Moscow, and many other film festivals winning awards and prizes world over. Then received Lifetime Achievement Award at Jerusalem International Film Festival and the Silver Hugo Award at the Chicago International Film Festival for unique vision and innovative work. In January 2015, he was awarded the Ari Einstein Prize for his achievements and contribution to Israeli cinema and culture. In 2016, then won the Ophir Lifetime Achievement Award by the Israeli Film Academy. His films cover a big range from the very commercial youth comedy Lemon Popsicle to the very personal The Distance and Foreign Sister, both of which won the Volgin Award for Best Film at the Jerusalem International Film Festival. Dan Wolman was honored with the Lifetime Achievement Award at the opening ceremony of the 49th IFFAI, and this program is also available in YouTube. I will request all our members to kindly go through that. Dan Wolman has served on the jury of different film festivals of the world. He taught cinema at Tel Aviv University, New York University School of Visual Arts. Please uh, uh, welcome, uh, we'd like to welcome our honorable guest today, Dan Wolman, with a, uh, with a warm heart. And uh, we also like to thank Parthoda for giving us this opportunity Time. and experienced tour 
who also brings his culture to the world in a different mode. I'm really uh, thankful to Dan Wallman, sir, that he has given us time in the midst of his uh, busy schedule. Thank you, sir, and a warm welcome to this uh, enlightening session. Thank you, and over to Pathoda. Thank you. Okay, uh, before uh, moderating uh, the sessions, I'd like to uh, request uh, Dan to speak a few lines about the what she says, how the session begins, something like that. First of all, I thank all of you for attending the Zoom session, for inviting me, for giving me your time. I hope that I won't disappoint you. Um, I'm now uh, working on a film. I'm now editing a new feature film. And uh, so it is, uh, you know, um, actually, I'm doing this Zoom session instead of editing. So <laughs> it is a big sacrifice, but uh, I'm kidding. And, uh, you know, I'm connected to India. I feel very much, uh, a, you know, a part of India. I, I can't explain why it's some sort of a mysterious connection, but India has power on me. And uh, I'm very happy to be in touch with you. And if uh, I can say anything that will help anybody, maybe there are some filmmakers, women filmmakers, uh, men filmmakers, uh, people who maybe I'll give you some sort of a tip or advice. I'd be happy if I can do something. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So uh, before, uh, beginning, before beginning the questions, I'd like to uh, put a uh, your experience when I made the first film in 1970, the Dima, and uh, interestingly, uh, that film was selected at the Cannes Film Festivals. So it is very rare that uh, when someone makes a film and th that first film goes for the Cannes, uh, uh, how the whole thing happened, please uh, uh, share that experience. You know, I think that uh, Orson Welles, uh, in a documentary film about himself, which was called F for Fake, yeah. <laughs> uh, he said, you know, I made the uh, citizen came and then I started my way downwards. The same thing with me. <laughs> and I'm joking. But, you know, the first film was actually shot in 1968. And, uh, you know, I think that there is something fresh when there is something inside you. And then you do the first film. Uh, sometimes it has more power than what comes after it. But there was something which, uh, you know, then you start thinking, you read. Uh, what people write about you, you start taking into account, uh, you know, uh, the public. So there is something about the first film, and it happened with that film. And uh, so I wrote a, sto a, a story. Uh, unfortunately, again, with the, I have a lot of problem uh, with raising money for my films, because many times the, let's say, the plot doesn't seem commercial to the uh, producers and uh, when I'm trying to raise money. And it was that kind of a thing. I wrote a story, it was very difficult. So I raised half of the money and I did something daring, which I continue doing all my life, which is starting to shoot without having all the money to finish the film. So that film, I, I raised $30,000 as a, a very young man, I was 26 years old. And then I found an American company that said, we'll give you the rest of the money that you need, you know, we'll give you another $70,000, but first we'll give you $30,000, shoot the film, and then if we like it, we'll give you the money to finish it. And if not, you have to give us back the money, but we won't put you in prison. In other words, they left it like that. So, you know, I decided to dare and we went, we shot the film in Israel, we came back, they hated it and they didn't want to give us the money to finish the film. And for two years, I was running around trying to raise the money. But, you know, the, as I was doing it, we were editing the film, we added music, we, you know, and the, the film improved. And then after about a year and a half, we succeeded in raising the money to finish the film. And in my country, the film opened the, and the, the critics didn't, they misspelled my name, nobody knew me. You know, I got, the people hated the film. It played in some cinema in Tel Aviv and people rolled empty bottles in the aisles, you know, to show how much they dis disliked the film. And suddenly the film was accepted to Cannes. And then it played in New York more than Bonnie and Clyde. It played for like four months 
in New York and was a big success, got very interesting reviews in the, in the New York Times and others. So crazy, crazy, you know, it's ups and downs, and which is very typical of my work. Yeah, that's 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 great. I can uh, when you're talking about that when your film Duma was there, it was screened in uh, Israel, and people uh, almost rejected. And acceptance came only when it was uh, selected in Cannes Film Festivals. So I can remember at the time when uh, Satyajit Ray's film uh, Pathar Panchali. Interestingly, uh, that was influenced by neorealism, uh, Italian neorealism. Uh, bicycle tips, Vittorio De Sica's the impact was there. So he reflected the poverty, Indian poverty in the film. But when it was screened in Kolkata, so what happened, people completely rejected. Uh, some of uh, the politicians used to say that uh, you are selling po Indian poverty uh, in abroad. <laughs> they was, but once it was selected in Cannes, they completely redesigned their thought. This is, I, I found the same thing in, uh, in case of you. So coming to your film, uh, Hide and Seek, uh, uh, that film uh, uh, is completely different from other <laughs> films because I feel that it talks about the homosexuality, hide and seek. So how uh, challenging it was to make the film on homosexuality in a, in a country uh, where homosexuality wasn't open? Yes. Well, uh, first of all, you know, the film is a very delicate film. And it's about a uh, you know a young boy, thirteen year old boy, yeah, yeah. Uh, who has a private tutor. Yeah. And the story, you know, there is a, a friendship. You know, in other words, we the children are speaking of a spy. It's a, a, like a, a war period, and uh, you know there are a lot of conflict in the country between the British because you know we were like India under the British control. Yeah. So there were you know the British, the Arabs and the Israelis. And this story about is about this boy who is together with other kids, and they find out that this man, this tutor, the private tutor, meets an Arab, and he exchanges letters with him. And they suspect that he's a spy, and they follow him, and then, you know, he's actually punished by the underground. But then we find out that it's not a question of being of espionage, that it is a love story. Now, this was the first feature film made in Israel about homosexuality. And uh, again, as I, I, you know, as I said, it's a very delicate film, but there is a scene there where you see the two men, you know, are in, uh, actually in bed, you know, in a very, very, you know, one is putting his arm around the other, and suddenly people from the underground come to punish them. And the boy is, sees it and he say, he shouts, you know, don't punish them, you know, leave them alone. And, you know, he's torn like that. So again, you know, it's, it's all, it was very dangerous to make such a film because it's the kind of film that no uh, Israeli parents, Israeli mother would like her children to go and see this film. Yes. Sir. And they would Ooh. like, uh, you know, young couples <clears throat> going to have a good time at the movies <laughs> uh, are not going to go and see this film. So from the start, I knew that this would have a very limited audience. And again, it's a, there are subjects that I, are important to me and I make the film and many people say to me, Dan, this is going to be your last film. You know, my first film, The Dreamer, deals with old people. It's, you know, it's, it takes place in an old age home. Yeah. And when I made my first film and I said, it's a story about old people, people told me, Dan, don't make this film. It's going to be your last film. Nobody likes to see old people. And this is something that, you know, even the film I'm making now, I'm telling you, it has a very limited audience. But, um, you know, as long as I don't owe people money and I can continue making my personal films True. about subjects that I think are important, you know, I'll continue doing it, uh, you know, because it's important for me. And I'm doing also other films. I'm doing films, you know, in order to survive and make money, I make other films. But uh, I made other films like about old people. I think I made the first feature film about old people. And I, I made a film about foreign workers, also a subject which is, uh, um, you know, not an easy subject. Um, so I'm saying that it was, 
it was the critics liked it, hide and seek, yeah. uh, the, but it did not do well in the cinemas. Yeah. But then again, it was selected, you know, it was shown in Berlin Film yeah, Festival, but, yeah. and it, it was popular there. Yeah. It also owned Silver Rose in, uh, in, in Israel. Ah, yes, you're right, right. It won, there is one, two big newspapers in Israel, and that was one of the papers, has had a competition at that time, and it won three or four uh, Silver Roses there. Yeah. Yes. I, just, I was curious to know, I means in selecting the child uh, uh, who is just uh, 13 years old, uh, casting the child because he looks very cute and pretty. So uh, how challenging it was to select the, uh, to cast the character, the small boy. Yeah. No, he. he I don't think that uh, he was cute. I'll tell you. Um, you know, I obviously I saw many kids. I I, I did the, like a screen test auditions, and. Uh, Again, it was very difficult because when, when I did the auditions, there was no school. When you have school, it's easy to, to, yes. to get big groups of children. So I went to the Boy Scouts, you know, and they were like in the fields and I, I, I selected the, you know, many people. And there were two kids. One of them was a very good looking kid, very nice. And he, this kid, the kid that I chose was a bit clumsy. And uh, something, you know, it was not the kind of kid, kid that you would say cute. I think so. <laughs> but, but, but there was something, you know, the, the question is really, do you believe him? You know, and obviously he was yeah. portraying, in a way he was portraying me. It was, you know, like, uh, uh, so I, I had to believe in him. And, and uh, you know, sometimes that's why I like to take actors that are not that popular. I like to take actors that, that you don't have to say, oh, this actor, he already, you know, like Anthony Queen, he was in Zorba the Greek and he was an Eskimo and he was a Mexican. I say, no, I want somebody that immediately you can believe that he is the character. True, true. Yeah, this, yeah, uh, it means uh, I, I, I just, uh, when I watched the film, that uh, sudden thought uh, between uh, the conversation between uh, the tutor and the young child. You, you have shown some close-up shots. That looks very delicately. You have uh, designed the shots, the close-up shots. It it looks it appeals me very much. So I like that particular shot, uh, shot division while uh, the tutor talks and he responses his reactions. I I like that particular thing very much. Yes, uh, before asking any questions from my side, I'd like to request some of the young filmmakers, some of the film school students, mass media students out there who would like to ask questions. I can continue asking questions uh, to them, but I'll let uh, the young people ask questions. Uh, uh, Baru, young or old? Yes, uh, Dimple Baru. Yes, sir. Am I audible? Yes, yeah, you are audible, please yeah, go ahead. Are you, are you yes, yes, I can hear you. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Patajita, for this opportunity. Hello, Dad. I am Dimple Barrow, student of mass communication and journalism from Page 4 University. So I had two questions. And my first question is, how has your childhood influenced your way of filmmaking over the years? Very, very difficult question because, uh, you know, obviously, um, I, th I think that when I was about uh, 15, 16 years old, I went to see a movie, you know, an Italian movie by, uh, you know, uh, Miracle in Milan, De Sica. And, uh, you know, like I couldn't talk for three days. It was like a magic, uh, magic for me. And uh, again, I'm exaggerating, but I'm saying that it had a lot of power. And I think that, uh, so that, you know, I, I, I felt that, that I belonged to that world that, uh, and there was something about it which fascinated me uh, <laughs> and the, the magic, you know, had power on me. So it was, you know, I was always interested in telling a story. And I remember that, uh, you know, when I, when I was about 14, 15 year old, uh, I was a, a, a scout in the scouts and I was like a leader. I had a group of 10 children and I, every Wednesday I'd meet, I'd meet them and I'd, I'd tell them a short story. So, for, you know, I love telling short stories. And in the short stories, there was always, you know, the, 
the creaking door and the voice of the cat and the, you know, then the dialogue by the different characters. And I enjoyed doing everything in that story. It was like making a film. And uh, even on, there was one uh, point where I had two uh, children who were blind. So it was very difficult and complex for me to tell them a story which they can uh, visualize because it was not enough to say the sea or the wind, you know, they have to demonstrate. So I'm saying, I can say that already then, you know, as a child, there was something that attracted me in telling a story in this medium, which is, you know, has all the others inside. Thank you Anything? so much, sir, yeah. for your response. That was really interesting to know. Uh, my second question is, how do you choose uh, the subject for your film? Is it your daily observation of your surroundings, our society, or is it there? Is there something else? Okay. Look, uh, I think that like many other filmmakers, I have my own personal films, which I get ideas and I write a screenplay. And some of them, I'll give you some examples. Like at the same time, you know, I believe in I believe in being that there is a lot of strength in being in working all the time. I'm trying to work all the time. I'm all, all the time moving. In other words, if I have my own idea and I don't uh, succeed in raising money for it, I will not sit in a cafe and stop making movies. So I'm 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 a, I'm a gun for hire. You know, let's say somebody wanted to make a, a comedy and he says, oh, Dan, you're a talented director. I'm producing and you will get a certain amount of money, direct the film for me. So I'm doing some films, which I'm not crazy about the story. Hey, don't I, huh? and, uh, I see people are speaking at the same time. It's a bit difficult. Okay. So, so what I'm saying is that you know, the question of, you know, the decision to make a film is a very, very important decision. Because if you make a mistake, you know, like let's say I'm writing a screenplay about something uh, that, you know, happened in, let's say, suddenly I get a good idea for a film. So then I say, okay, now I'm going to devote the next three years of my life, I'm going to write a screenplay, submit it to a lot of uh, grants to private people, etc. Then I'm going to try to raise money. Then I'm going to make the film. And then suddenly you say, oh, it was a bad idea. You know, so it's a big decision to decide what is the, what kind of film to make. But at the same time, you know, I'm contacting people and they say, and I'm saying, you know, I'm a gun for hire. Do you have any comedy or a thriller or a Kung Fu film that I could make? You know, I'm, I'm open to everything. Also, document, documentaries also. That was Any quite questions? enlightening, sir. Thank you so much for your response. Yeah, we we'll have some other questions. I want to ask a question, if you allow me. Uh, Bharti, just uh, take us. Uh, uh, yes, please go ahead. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, uh, you have been uh, associated with many festivals, uh, particularly in India. And I have seen in one interview that you have been here in more than 20 cities for, you know, as a jury member. So in your eyes, how Indian cinema has been changed in various perspectives. Uh, can you just, uh, 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 can you please uh, share your experience regarding that? Look, um, first of all, I'm not such an expert. The truth is that uh, you know, because I am, I was in uh, many, many cities in India, then it could be Lucknow or it could be uh, uh, Kochi or it could be, you know, any, I was in many film festivals. And because, uh, you know, I'm on the jury, I can see a lot of Indian films that many Indians don't see. Because, you know, these are films that normally don't get distribution, a lot of them, or definitely not mass distribution. So, there you can see uh, films which I, I care about a lot. Again, I admire, okay, Bollywood, and uh, you know, obviously with all its talent, etc. But I am there is something in me which is for independent cinema, and you know, 
I would say, honest, independent cinema, dealing with the, not only entertainment, but also dealing with problems. So I think, again, I'm speaking now to, uh, to you know, maybe to young filmmakers and saying that you find a lot of great talents in India. And uh, I think that people at this generation, on the one hand, have a lot of luck because uh, to make a film now is not as expensive as it was before. Because now, you, you know, with very little money, you and some friends can get a good camera for a very small sum of money and, you know, shoot a film with friends. It's very easy. Can you imagine of what it was like to move a camera at the time of uh, when they did The Birth of a Nation and how light it is to shoot a the camera? There are a lot of women cameramen now in my country you know, because it's much easier and it's not such a physical thing to carry the camera. So, uh, you know, I'm saying that in India, I think now there is a lot of place for independent filmmakers. Unfortunately, the distribution, uh, and also uh, there is a problem because uh, there is, it's very difficult to distribute a film, which is a, an art film or an independent film dealing with problems. And also, like, I think that it is important, like in my country and so on, to force television channels that they should have, you know, at least one day a week where they would show films which are not commercial. And, uh, and like we have now a channel which shows at prime time, it's a regular television channel on prime time to show documentaries, you know, good documentaries. It's also, I think that I, maybe I'm, I'm not that familiar, but I didn't see in India. So I'm saying, I think there should be a pressure of a lot of people and filmmakers and intellectuals to press the government to force television stations to do that. Thank you, Bharati. Thank and, you. Uh, thank you, Dan, for explaining in a very, uh, in a very meticulous way. <laughs> okay. The, okay, now uh, uh, I like to request, uh, Bhaskar is there, no? Bhaskar is a young filmmaker, he has uh, questions, Bhaskar. Yes, I am here. Yes. So I have a question, uh, I read that, am I audible, sir? Yes, yes I can hear you. I can hear you. Video don't go low, by. Please go ahead. Mr. Kishore, go ahead. It's you? Uh, no. It's, am I audible, sir? Ah, it's Mr. Bashka. Yeah. Sorry, I have okay. read that they used to the, uh, in Israeli Defense Forces before you went to uh, study cinema in New York City College. So uh, we often got news about the cross-border conflicts in Israel. And uh, then, then at that, that time also the Palestinian uh, federal insurgency was there. So even being in Defense Forces, how the uh, investor for filmmaking was grew inside you? Uh, it was very difficult for me to uh, hear you, understand you. Did you ask about uh, about the, uh, the about the the school in America and and the study no, sir, in America? I, I asked you that, that you I read somewhere that uh, you were so uh, in uh, Israel Defense Forces. That, 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 uh, then just let, me, uh, let me read his questions because his voice yes. is cracking. Just. Let me read the question. So he said that uh, I read that you served in Israel Defense Forces before you went to study cinema uh, in City yes. College, New York. We often get news about cross border conflict in Israel. And at that time, also, Palestine Fadain insurgency was happened. So, even being in Defense Force, how the interest in filmmaking or the love for cinema grew inside you? Okay, so actually it's a question about politics, right? And the, the question is something that has to do with my serving in the Israeli army, which I did serve in the army many, many years ago. In 1958, you can imagine, you know, for two and a half years I was a soldier. And the question is, and now I didn't understand the second part of the question, is it, is it regarding how cinema reflects this conflict? Uh, he wants to say how uh, in certain social political environment, the, the filmmaking, the interest of filmmaking came to you. How, how it influences me? Yeah. 
Okay. I, look. First of all, I am. Uh, you know, there are different, different. There are different types of uh, obviously filmmakers, and people say their things differently. And I am a more. I'm a more soft person. I'm a more delicate person. I don't like slogans. I don't like propaganda films. I don't. I think that life is complex. I think that you know it's not the Palestinians are right and the Israelis are wrong or the opposite. I think it has all kinds of shades. And I think among us there are people who are terrible and uh, corrupt, etc. And on the other side, you know, and it's very complex. And my films they tend to show the complexity and not be like that. And but uh, in my films there is uh, the the subject or the political subject does appear. And uh, for example, in the in that uh, love story in in hide and seek, it's basically it's a love story between an Arab. Uh, they are being punished. They are being punished, you know, and because they are, you know, they, they can hold hands together, and they're be being punished. But also in other films of mine, the subject is there, and I definitely, uh, you know say what I think, you know, I think that there should, for example, I'm against the, the conquest, you know, I love my country, I love Israel, I, I love my tribe and my culture, but at the same time, I don't think that we should have a state and other people should not have a state. So in my films, you can also find uh, politics. At the backdrop of love story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he had another question, he had just uh, text me, so yes. yeah, just I'm going to read it uh, on his behalf. He said, in an interview, you say that you don't like storyboards. Mm. You want to be alive on the set, but for a young filmmaker going to set or location without storyboards, it is difficult. So how do you manage to make things possible without a storyboard? Okay, I think it's a good question. But again, I don't think it has to do, you know, it has to do with the head, you know, how, how one thinks. And uh, think, for example, let's say if you are, there is something about you which you don't like people, you know, to stand behind you and say, do this, do that. So as a film director, let's suppose that you're doing a commercial, okay? So many times they, they make a storyboard for a soap commercial and they show the factory that produces soap, they show them the storyboard, okay? There is a man here, there is a machine here, he takes the soap, he puts it in. I'm not saying it's a woman, so I'm changing it. Said there's a man, okay, putting soap in the in the machine and the, you know, the, the laundry comes out white. Okay, so I'm saying for me as a director to come, look at the storyboard, which has been decided together with the boss and do exactly what it says, for me is something which is against my nature. And so, and I, I am a different person every day. And, and it, so I'm saying, yes, it's a good idea, I think, to, to make a storyboard. Uh, and I think, but then to be able to throw it away, you know, when you come to the set, you suddenly see that something changed, you know, you didn't plan it, but it's raining. So, you know, I was on sets where they planned something and, you know, the director wanted it to be exactly like the storyboard. You know, and there was a cloud in the sky and the cloud, you know, the people were shot under the cloud. And then, you know, the whole uh, crew of uh, 40 people are waiting for another cloud to cover the actors so they continue shooting. No, I am, I'm a person who doesn't have much money. I'm very flexible. I'm not going to wait for another cloud. And then if there is an animosity between the main star, the actor and the actress, you know, it, it will suddenly I'll say, how can I use this animosity between the actors? They don't like one another. How can I use it in my script? So I'm not, you know, fixed idea that I'm coming with something when that I type and I'm going to do it the same day. I think it's like a painter. And every time you look at the painting, you say, wow, let's put some more blue. Let's change. I think you have to, you know, flow. Yes. Any Thank more questions? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, we have uh, another student, uh, Akansha Bhagavati. She is uh, doing her master's in mass communication. She is going to 
put some uh, questions. Yes, over to Akansu Babu. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Dan. Hi. And uh, hello, everyone. So, uh, like you spoke about the storyboard. So, I have this question in my mind that uh, how do you actually visualize a scene? Like, uh, you know the script, suppose you know what is to be done, but in script, it's just a line or two, right? But when you go to the set and you think that, okay, this is how I'm going to make my scene. So, how does that visualization happen? If okay. not the storyboard? Yeah. Yes. Look, first of all, I'm usually uh, I'm, I'm doing I, I like you know like when I let's say uh, I, I draw something and say okay I'm going to draw a table so what I like to do or when I when I want when I have to write a let's say a paragraph an outline okay I have an idea for a comedy and I'm going to write something you know so some people you know they they are perfectionist and they're waiting to do it right no I'm that's not me I like to make mistakes I like to do it as it comes out and the same thing I'm doing when I'm coming to the set. So let's say I'm coming to, with the, the actors. I know there's a scene where there, there's a man, uh, let's say, sitting at home. A friend comes to visit him, and th there is some sort of a conflict. So I, I explain to the actors, and I say to them, OK, you're at home. Suddenly, you know, say the bell rings. OK, you put the towel. You've just been, uh, I don't know, washing. You put the towel on the chair. You come to the door. You open it. You're coming in and then you offer him something to drink and there's a conflict. So many times, again, this is my style. Obviously, there are many directors who try differently, but I tell them, you know, do it your way. I want to see it. It's much easier for me to build the thing. Once I see it bad, then I can correct it. So many times I say to them, OK, how would you do it? OK, let's try it. And then immediately I'll say, oh, it looks terrible. You shouldn't put the towel on the chair. You should, you know, throw it on the bed at the same time. And he's very upset. You know, he comes, he doesn't even look at it, whatever. So many times that's what I do. You know, I, I, but obviously sometimes I definitely have an idea. And, you know, many times there are, you know, it's suddenly I say, I know that there, that there should be something where he's standing by the window, you know, and she should go there and she puts her sand their hand inside the aquarium with the goldfish, whatever. In other words, you know, there's certain things that I know should happen, but I get a lot of ideas from, you know, things which were not planned. Let's say, you know, when I wrote the script, I didn't know that the rays of the sun would come this way to the window, and I didn't know that the cat would be angry or whatever. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm always, I'm, for me, now when I come to a set, I always say the camera should be here, here. There's only one place which I think is right to put the camera. And maybe it's because of experience that now, for me, there's only one place to put the camera. Obviously, depending on the budget, because you know, many filmmakers today, especially, you know, in the old days, when I shot my films, 16 millimeter, 35 millimeter, and I had no money, I had to shoot at the ratio of four or five to one. Today, they shoot 50 to one. You know, and then they say, we'll make the editing decisions later. And they shoot from a lot of angles and so on. But I prefer to shoot cinema style where I can envision what is going to be on the screen. And that's, even though I'm shooting now with red, I'm shooting now with the most advanced, uh, you know, uh, 4K, whatever it is, uh, you know, cameras, I'm not shooting a lot of material. I'm shooting it as if it were film because, you know, I'm. I want it to be the way I envision it, not leave everything uh, to the editor to decide later with me. Yeah, thank you very much. So I also have another question. Uh, you spoke about like how you have an idea and you make it into a screenplay. So what happens uh, is that when you have an idea, uh, at least for me, I get very distracted by the many elements that I have observed. So to stick to one specific point, is it becomes difficult at times. So I just want to ask that, how do you actually develop an idea into a script? Like if you could share some tips. So that's okay. what. Look, I think, you know, a lot of, there are lots of uh, books written about it, you know, and, and so on. But uh, I think that, you know, if it's a question of common sense, okay? Let's say I made a film called Tide Hands and it's based on something that happened with me. In other words, I came to visit a friend of mine who had AIDS. And, uh, you know, at a certain point, he said, Dan, do you want to smoke grass with me? 
And uh, when I was a student in America, I smoked grass. So uh, I said to him, but immediately because he was, he had AIDS, you know, and, and, I, and I didn't see him for many, for a long time. And I, immediately I saw it as a, a nice act of friendship. And he said, Dan, do you want to smoke with me? And I said, yes, you know, and, and then, uh, you know, I, I, it doesn't matter, but uh, I was with him there and I, I stayed there and after a month, anyhow, he died from AIDS. Again, I'm speaking about 1991. And then I went home and uh, two or three months later, suddenly I had an idea about a mother who takes care of her son who is ill. And he, the only thing that helps him uh, uh, for his pain is when he smokes grass. And the story is about a 70 year old woman who wants to help her son and she goes out during the night to look for grass for him because he's in pain. So obviously so I'm, I'm asking myself, writing the story, what is my aim, okay? What is the person, what is his goal? So it could be an, an Indian, you know, who is a, a parents, I don't know, his father committed suicide in the village and he's coming to the big city and he wants to do something and he's trying to get a job in the industry, okay? So obviously like my, my, I knew that here I have a mother is trying to get grass. For me as a screenwriter, I'm going to make it very difficult for her to get the grass, okay? There are gonna be a lot of problems for her. The police are going to catch her. She's going to be put, because I want to make an interesting film where there's conflict, okay? And I'm saying the same thing, your young woman who comes from the village and is trying to get the thing, there's gonna be, there are going to be hopes and she's going to, you know, have problems, etc. So you always think, you know, what people are attaining and uh, it's a question of common sense. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So uh, we have Abhishek Barthakur. He, he has some curiosity to know about uh, Dan. Yes, uh, Abhishek. Uh, shalom Dan. Shalom. I'm Abhishek. I am from uh, Sam Gohati. I just have uh, two questions for you. Uh, while going through the all uh, have done towards your entire lifetime, uh, I just wanted to know from you that you are associated with both films and theater. Both what? Theaters, Asso associated, you're as with? associated with both theaters and cinemas. Theater, theater. Right, right, right. Uh, and both reflect uh, social and personal issues, social and both personal issues of a life. So according to you, who is more powerful, theaters or cinemas? Mm. You know, these are two different, you know, it's like comparing, uh, you know, painting and the singing. It's uh, the question of power because um, I'm basically, I'm more a cinema person, you know, and I'm, I'm, I made movies, but then sometime, like, you know, I'm trying, I wrote a story I'm trying to raise money for it and all my friends and rich people and i'm uh, trying to get grants you know it's always difficult you're writing these long forms you're sending to people and you get no 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 and then you say why don't i write a play from it okay i just need the seller i need three four actors i don't need money i need just friends and you can do it and people can come and see it so i think that sometimes it's a good idea even when you have something for the cinema to do it first as a play, you know, without getting my involved with money and so on. And then you also improve it. You know, you, you work with the actor and you get a lot of ideas. I did it with Ben's biography. I wrote Ben's biography and it was, I meant to make a film. I was not successful. I did it as a play, as, as a one man show. And it did, you know, it was in Edinburgh. It was in many places in America as a, a, a play, theater. And, but then I got a lot of ideas as I was doing it. And I, when I then late, I got money and I made the film. Thank you. Uh, the next question is like, uh, I also wanted to know that uh, you came out from a film school in the year 1965 and you joined as an academic. So what influenced you as a filmmaker after Matt? What, again, what is, I studied, you know, both places are universities or college. Uh, you know, City College and then NYU. But what is the, the, the question? I'm going to repeat once more. Uh, you came out of film school in the year 1965 and you joined as an academic, right? So, no. uh, so what no, no, influenced? Because, no, because 
I went to City Film Institute of City College and I continued at NYU Film School. It was then I, I got a BA in education, but both of them were film schools. Okay. Okay. So after math, what influenced you to make films as an uh, academic? I see. No, I'm telling you, I knew already when I was, uh, before even the army, I knew, I said, I'm going to become a filmmaker. And, you know, people around me knew me as a very shy person who speaks very quietly. Now I'm, I, I, I have more, uh, let's say, self-assuredness. But at that time, I was a very shy person and uh, people could not imagine me saying action. So, but, so I'm saying, but I knew that I wanted to become a filmmaker before that and i think that the fact that i studied for a ba in education you know i suddenly the, uh, there were lots of courses that really uh, added a lot of things to me you know the, the the world of the academy psychology of sociology mythology and all other courses uh, gave me a lot of ideas and enriched me uh thank you uh dan for that uh... Thanks. Isak Krasel, are there? Isak Krasel? Isak Krasel? Hello? Oh, yes. Yes. Am I audible? Yes. Please go ahead. Please go ahead with your question. Sir, I just want to just a small question that you said you want to make a documentary. So what sort of documentary you'd like, like to make? make? Okay. Um, again, these, these, these the, I've made some documentaries and you know, some for television and some for people. And uh, I'll give you an example now. Um, there is a, like a man who was doing some research about what happened in Second World War in, in Germany. So there is a, a, a couple actually that they made research and they discovered something that nobody knows about. And that is that in 1908, there was a school for children with uh, handicapped children and people who are autistic, children who are autistic. So this, there was some a school very unusual because in the beginning of the 20th century, children who were autism, you know, autistic, would be sent to either insane asylums or to monasteries. And they found that there was a good school, there was a Jewish school near Berlin, but the people from that school in 1942, they were taken by the Nazis, sent to the camps, and they were killed there together with the children. So somebody told me about that story, and, they, and, they, and I, I said that I would, it's so fantastic. I'm very interested in the subject of autism and, and, and children with problems. So that subject that there existed in the beginning of the 20th century, such an institute, and that the people who were heading that institute were sent to be killed at Sobibor camp in, at that period in 1942, that attracted me. And I said, wow, that would be a documentary that I would like to direct. So I spoke to these people and they said, yes, we are looking for a director. So I'm just giving you as an example. But many times, you know, when I look around and somebody tells me, you know, that would make this guy, uh, for example, they told me about a woman who was a, a spy in Egypt in uh, the 40s of uh, the previous century. They said this woman was a spy. So I'm saying, wow, fascinating. I want to learn about her. I want to make a documentary film about her. I'm saying I'm... Uh, you know, I'm all the time opening my, my ears, my eyes, and I'm looking for subjects. Because even when I'm not, I don't get money, I get a camera and I start shooting. Because, uh, you know, it's a part of my life to continue doing things all the time. Uh, thank you, Isak Raz. So, uh, Bhaskar, uh, he has uh, put a question in the chat box. So, he has written that, I'm just reading out his questions. So you are telling about some movies that did not run well. What is your perspective towards a bad film? Okay, this is something for everybody. I'm saying 
there's no i'm saying what is you know this thing is not that important okay get good film bad film i'm saying what is your fun okay i don't know even when you are in high school okay with some friends or well, you know some friends on the weekend and you have the pleasure of making a movie there is something about the camaraderie you know that you, when you meet the people everybody you've seen uh, the three four movie about you know i think it's called american night or uh, about you know making a movie and so i'm saying that there is for me uh, making a movie is a, a big pleasure you know when you have the passion for a movie for making a movie it's a big pleasure you make the film and then okay at the end it gets bad reviews people don't like it they say it's a bad film or it's a good film the pleasure of making the film you know that doesn't it doesn't matter if it's a good film or a bad film or if it gets good reviews or bad reviews yes there are i see i see now especially with these little light cameras and the fact that you don't need much money there are a lot of terrible films being made and after some time i say okay i'm not going to watch this it's uh, like drinking bad wine and you know, or whatever you drink a little glass you say i'm not going to finish the whole bottle so okay you you stop watching the film yes you know and the different tastes some people love a certain film which i hate and the opposite but i'm saying i'm speaking about the filmmaker i think it shouldn't it shouldn't worry about it he should do what he believes in that's true yeah i agree with you a filmmaker should make what he believes to yes that is a, that is the sentence i uh, uh, i'm touched yeah yes uh, tuhin koina bora has raised uh, yes tuhin koina are going to ask yes sir yes please hello uh, my question is that as a director how do you prepare your actors i mean uh, most of your films like hide and seek and nana they are uh, thought provoking and uh, like uh, challenging the stereotypes so how do you prepare your actors it's a good question look first of all don't mix nana and uh, hide and seek or whatever because nana was again a, a kind of a stupid film which i made to you know some people wanted me to make a film and i said i want to survive i want to pay my electricity bill and etc etc buy food so i made this film but it's not a thought provoking film my film okay but hide and seek and i'm saying in general when i work with actors it, there are many directors who like rehearsals and i i don't like rehearsals because you know and there are i don't know if you uh, you you've read about it but you know there are different directors who believe that some directors believe that uh, in you know you 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 know some directors believe in the freshness of the actors you know and uh, like uh, there is the famous example of renoir versus uh, i think john ford there is always this uh, example that they give that john ford said that when somebody says i love you you know that he would say it right and if somebody says the director says say 20 times i love you i love you i love you okay you will say it right after the 21st time so i'm saying okay you want 21 re rehearsals to say i love you i prefer no i want to take the first three times that he says it. so i'm saying the different techniques and i respect and some directors get very good results using different methods but for me there is enough time when when they, they put the lights you know obviously i speak to the actors before i meet them the night before you know we speak about the dialogue but for me the 20 minutes half hour that you have or hour when they prepare the lights and so on you speak to the actors it's i think it's enough time to get very good results and uh, i can say that uh, as a young director i think that i did not i was so uh, how do you say uh, I, I feared so much that I would be in control that I didn't respect my actors. In other words, I would, I would be like a dictator. Walk here, do this, do that, and so on. And then I realized that many of the actors work with other directors. They work with uh, you know, unusually fantastic uh, you know, scripts, material. It could be in theater, you know, Shakespeare, or whatever, but very you know, material wise writers. We worked with many of this, and they have experience and many of the actors are very wise and i so many times i shoot the, the scene i make one or two uh, shots you know i take two takes my way and then i 
ask the actors their advice and so on. But it's always a very delicate thing but because there are some directors who are so weak, you know, that they let everybody speak and everybody makes a suggestion. That's not the way. I don't like it. And I don't like when a cameraman or soundman and so on, like a cameraman says, hey, Dan, it's a good idea. Why don't you shoot from here? No, I, ne I never work like this, you know? I tell the cameraman before we start shooting, if you have a good idea, never, you know, suggest it in the beginning of the, when we're starting to shoot, because you'll say, Dan, it's a good idea to shoot from there. I'll never shoot from the place you say, because it intimidates me. What I want to do is at a certain point, you take me to the side, and you say, Dan, can I, can I suggest something? And then I would say, okay, yes. And he'd say, what do you think about there? It's a, I say, ah, it's a good idea, you know? But I'm saying it all has to be done. Remember that the director is the person who is in charge. And uh, so with the actors also, you know, it's very bad sometimes, you know, sometimes when you work with actors who are more famous than you, it's also very, very difficult. So, because, you know, sometimes, sometimes the producer likes the, very famous actors, and he will fire you if they don't like you. So I think it's very important that in the negotiations, before you start shooting the film, you speak to him and say, I am sensitive. You know, I want to, first of all, that you'll give me a chance to do it my way. Give me three takes. Then the fourth take, I'll let you lead and you'll do it your way. So it's a question of common sense negotiation. Got it. Thank you so much. Uh, I like to read out one uh, questions uh, put by Lekha Hoikia. He wants to know the, the dancer, what is more important to design a story, observing the society or imagine a character situation? I, for me, it's uh, not clear. And I think it's very bad to make such a, you know, like a, a decision. And again, I, it depends on the situation, but I think that if there is some sort of a, if you, you know, I think it, or let's say my way in order for me not to uh, overrule other ideas or other stories, but I'm saying if you like my, in my film, in many of my films, there is somebody who is doing things and he has conflict with society. He's different, you know? If somebody is different than society. So let's say in hide and seek, society, people are like in a siege state. You know, it's a country where everybody has to be like everybody. And you know, these are the enemies and we have to fight them. And, and my character is different. You know, he, he thinks that uh, people are, uh, and, and the, the enemy is not the enemy. The enemy is exactly like us and so on. So it is a clash of the individual and society around him. But so I'm saying, I think it depends, you know, to make a film about social problems without focusing on a certain thing, I don't know if it's possible. So I don't know if I'm answering the question, but the best I can do. Uh, thank you, Dan. So we have another question by Nena Boro. She asked, so what is the hardest artistic choice you made in the making of this film at any stage in production? Nena Boru, are you there? The, the hardest uh, decision? Yeah, this, uh, what is the hardest choice? Yeah, this, uh, uh, Nena Boru, are you there? Look, you want to? Yeah, she's not here. Maybe uh, uh, disconnected or something like that. What is the hardest artistic choice you made? I don't get the question. So yes. I don't know. Look, yeah. Can I, I will say yes. something about it? Yes, yes, please go ahead. Okay. Look, um, sometimes you have to make a decision which, uh, you know, is very difficult for the actor. Okay, you know, in other words, uh, for example, when I made the film, My Michael, there is a certain scene where the actress has to cut all her hair, okay? She has to be, uh, and, and in other words, there is something about her life where she's very unhappy with herself, she's depressed, and, and she decides to just cut all her hair. 
as an act. And uh, now this was in the screenplay, I mean, in the script. And when I shot the film, you know, I said, okay, let's go to the barber and we cut the hair. And the actress was crying and I was not sensitive enough. Again, this is a film we shot in 1974. I was not sensitive enough. Probably I was busy because I'm doing too many things, but I was not there when they cut her hair. And, uh, and then when I realized what happened, I felt terrible because, you know, I, I, I was not a good director at that point. You know, it was not in shooting. But some say, Tana, you make, you make certain decisions which are very difficult, you know. Uh, and uh, the actors, obviously, uh, you're, you're with the actor. The, the, the director wants me, I don't know, to show me naked from uh, running into the sea. And I, uh, sorry, Dan. Yeah. Uh, Obisek uh, Bortakur, please uh, mute your audio. Obisek Bortakur, please mute your let me do that. Just... Okay. No, so I'm just saying that one has to be to pay attention to details. So I made the decision. That was a very bad uh, decision that I made at that point. Uh, so our Belago question is: Is there any questions? So uh, uh, I had two, three questions, but uh, I think it it will be better if because uh young filmmakers are there and from your worst experience if you can give them some tips uh in terms of uh filmmaking in terms of choosing the subject that will be on the okay. Okay. this person wants to ask a question yes, please. uh john you can ask the questions yeah yeah uh, hello sir uh my yes. question is that like uh you have, you have said just now that sometimes you just need to get into flow while shooting uh, instead of uh, uh, you know uh, be dependent on storyboarding on and, and, and on all that so uh, my question is uh, sometimes when we uh, get in the flow while shooting there is also a possibility to get uh, divert from the intention of the scene the scene that we are shooting so uh, what do you want to say regarding that you're saying that sometimes when you shoot the film you suddenly uh, you're not concentrating on what you should concentrate. Is no, that what like, like uh, you as you said that like uh, during shooting, we need uh, sometimes you uh, as your process you get in, into the flow of uh, while shooting instead of depending on storyboarding and all that. So like, is there a possibility to get divert from the intention of the scene oh. okay. while doing that? Yeah. Look, I, what I meant was that one should, I don't think it's a bad thing to make a storyboard, okay? And definitely when I was a student in some of the classes, they, this, this is how we learned. They said, okay, so you have to plan how, you know, and as you know, uh, Walt Disney does a film, when Disney makes a film uh, or uh, Hitchcock made a film, there were storyboards. So I'm saying it's not a bad idea, but I'm saying that one shouldn't become a slave to it but I'm saying there is a script and there's the dialogue. And so everything that is there already. But, I, but, but I'm saying that sometimes you get good ideas on the set. Why, why, why suddenly rely on that thing that you prepared 10 days ago and not suddenly that you say you have a good idea, you know, not, not do it. So I'm saying, okay, I, have, I thought of something, but now it's new, I'm in this room and everything looks different than it was when I typed the screenplay. Because, you know, places look different. Okay. Uh, I hope I answered you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, Dan, just uh, briefly give some yes. tips. Uh, okay. I, I will say something. Yeah. I'm saying that among the students, I'm sure there are people who would like to become filmmakers. And I'm saying that you are lucky to be born at this time an era because I think that let's say that you are, let's say that you have, a sh you know, like think of a, a filmmaker in uh, Mumbai or think a filmmaker now in Los Angeles is trying to make a film. Normally it takes four, six years for a filmmaker to make a film. So I'm saying that, let's say that you have, a sh let's say that you have a shop, 
okay, and you sell shoes, or you, you work in a, as a pharmacist or, or something, and you have a small income. I think that today you can decide, I'm not going to be a part of the industry, but I'm going to make a good film. It's going to take me four or five years. And then, so you am saying, you write a script by yourself with some friends. And then you say, you continue working in the pharmacy where you work. And then, but every three weekends, you meet with the friends and you start do, doing storyboards and you write the screenplay with friends. And after a year, you have a screenplay, but you, you don't, you know, in other words, I'm trying to encourage you, the whoever, the young filmmaker, I'm trying to encourage you not to uh, be, depend and develop a begging thing. I depend on this. Nobody wants to give me money. You know, I have a great idea. I'm going to submit to this. Say, no, do it yourself. You believe in the script? Say, okay, so it's going to take a little more time, you know? And so I'm saying, but develop it yourself, shoot it yourself. Today, to buy a good camera, you can buy for, again, I don't know how many rupees, but today for, I think about $1,500, $1,500, you can buy a great, a great camera, and then you, you can put it on DCP, show it on a big screen, and it'll look like any other film. So you don't need, you know, millions of dollars. You don't need hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I'm telling you that if you look in my, at my career, you will see that I had films in Venice and the budget was $30,000. And, you know, sometimes, you know, I say my little film is there in Moscow Film Festival and there are some next to it, there are films with Meryl Streep or with someone else and the film cost $80 million and so on and mine cost $80,000 or whatever. So I'm saying I'm trying to push you to become independent and do what you like. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. So we have come to the end of the session. So uh, okay. now, okay, I, I would like to request uh, Dipanita Das, a renowned Odyssey artist, uh, not yet academic, to offer the word of thanks. Over to Dipanita. Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Patrajit, sir. What a little sir, is a very uh, beautiful session that you have uh, delivered, the lectures that you have delivered. So it was really a privilege for us that an international acclaimed filmmaker from Israel, Don Wallman, is with us today. And the conversation has enlightened us with many different aspects regarding uh, his childhood, his filmmaking, how, the, how he started with his first uh, film in 1968, how he sh uh, shoot the film. And uh, he also had given us a few tips on how, how ideas has been uh, created into a script and his hardships while you have prepared your movies so it, it was really very nice and enlightened for us so uh we are privileged and uh, honored that uh, dan for sparing his valuable time uh, to deliver a lecture uh, from his busy schedule and we look forward to listen to your lecture in your future so i would like to thank uh, uh, and offer gratitude to bharti yeah. bharali assistant professor department of mass communication guwahati university and we would also also like to thank our very own Parthidhi the founder of uh, Sunlit Studio Film Club, film scholar, uh, an Indian member of uh, Fee Presky. And uh, we would like to offer our gratitude to the respected members of Sunlit Film uh, Club, which consists of veteran filmmakers, award-winning filmmakers, professors, journalists, film school students, media students, actors, artists, writers, historians, and many more. So we also like to offer thanks to uh, the guest who graced the occasion today. And uh, it was really nice hearing to you, uh, Dan. And we would really love to hear to you more in uh, further such sessions. Thank you so much. Uh, over to Parchadit Burwa, sir. Uh, thank you, Dipanita Das. You have, you have just summarized the whole session in a very beautiful way. Thank, thank you, Dipanita. You. So uh, i like to thank you. Uh, Dan. Uh, some uh, last few sentences with your sentences uh, some few words we will uh, conclude the session yes over to them look um, this uh, 
pandemic, uh, this uh, the corona period is very bad for me because again, especially at this age where uh, for me to go abroad and I go a lot to a lot of countries, it could be India or China or Nepal or Armenia, I'm not speaking about obviously America and uh, South America and uh, you know, I was in Fiji, Australia, etc. But you know, it is uh, something at this age, I say every year I want to be in a new in a new country, I want to meet more people, I want to have an exciting life, and suddenly to be home with my computer, afraid of uh, big gatherings, and so on is really a big curse. And of course, this thing distanced me from India. So I'm saying this is a little Zoom session. It's a little bit like being in India, and I really uh, appreciate you uh, uh, inviting me to join you on this session. And uh, for me, uh, young people, old people who are who want to make films, uh, and I can push them a little to not to do, you know, to go the, the regular way, but to be daring and try to do things independently, to do what they like. I, in that thing is uh, something which is a part of my mission, and I'm glad that you helped me uh, do my thing also. So really, thanks. What can I say? Thanks. Uh, uh, what uh, impressed me most uh, in Dan, what I have seen, is uh, the, the passion uh, for good cinema, the energy you have uh, shown that inspired the young filmmakers. It's because of your uh, passion towards good cinema, it is because of a love towards good cinema that, that gives us a new meaning towards, uh, uh, towards our life. So I'm sure the young filmmakers who are there here in Assam, India, so they will be highly enlightened uh, through these conversations. And we are really lucky that uh, Don Ullman is with us today. Uh, the, the filmmaker who has, who has changed the grammar, cinema, grammar, cinema language in, in wall cinema. Thank you, Dan. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. So I officially and formally say that the session has come to an end. Thank you once again for your available time. Thank Bye. you. Toda, Toda, then, Toda. Bye. Bevakasha. Call to. Toda. Toda. Thank you. Thank you. Namaskar. Thank you. Namaskar.